Coming up on Tech News Today, Apple or Android? Who won the battle for our smartphones this year? Plus, the concussion protection tech inside an NFL football helmet. And what happens when Hello Kitty Town gets hacked? This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, December 21st, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of freelancers and small businesses the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is a show where we talk to the tech news, talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I am Megan Maroney. I think I'm still Megan Maroney. And our co-anchor today is Lindsay Turrentine, editor-in-chief at CNET.com. Welcome, Lindsay. Hi, Megan. Happy to see you this uh, week, last week of the year, really, right? It is the last week of the year. Uh, we, you know, this is the last time we'll talk to you until the new year and you'll be at CES and everything will be new and different. So you go straight from the stress of the holidays to the stress of CES. Are you ready for that? I. <laughs> you look ready. Sure, sure. <laughs> So this morning, everyone is talking about last night's 60 Minutes interview with Tim Cook, Angela Aaron, some other folks uh, at Apple. Of course, um, 60 Minutes is on CBS, and CBS is owns uh, CNET, so uh, we're not going to talk specifically about 60 Minutes or uh, their relevance in today's media. Uh, but what did you think, because of course you work for CNET, and, uh, but what did you think of Cook's defense of encryption to start off with? Well, I thought he said I thought he said what he can say, right? I mean, you know, he's going to he's never going to say we're not going to protect our users and he's never going to say we're not going to comply with the law. So it was kind of milk toast, but he I don't I don't I can't see a different answer coming from him to be quite honest. Right. I mean, I, I liked his words. I mean, I, of course, am a Tim Cook fan, but um, I liked what he said. It's overly simplistic to think that we can't have privacy and national security at the same time, uh, that we can do it. Just let's figure out a way. I mean, that that's what I took away from it. Sure. And, you know, I mean, we have to figure out a way, right? There isn't, he's right, there isn't really a choice. And, and certainly what we do not want is to give away our information um, because it might make it a little bit easier for the government. So yeah, let's figure it out. I just hope that that's actually possible. Right. I mean, in some ways, like just the way Apple functions, he's in a better position than some of the bigger companies like Facebook and Google, uh, just constantly being forced to ask to give away information or or places, uh, networks where people are uh, do you know, are doing illegal activity, saying things, you know, pledging their allegiance or not publicly or not to different, uh, you know, terrorist organizations. So Apple is in some way um, positioned in a way that it is easy for him to say that, I think. Certainly. And they have, you know, they have pole position and they will until they run out of that huge buffer of money. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so speaking of their huge buffer of money, um, some of the Big Apple news is that a Swedish mobile telecom gear maker Ericsson uh, has signed a deal with Apple in order to settle a patent dispute. Uh, so this is over LTE patents. Is that correct? That's that's right. Um, it's a little bit wonky, but they've decided that you know they're going to settle. Uh, all of the ongoing litigation will end, and that they'll work work together going forward. I'm very curious about work, what working together going forward means. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know what to, to make of this either. I mean, it's a global license agreement. Um, they settled out of court. Um, I guess they're paying, Apple has to pay Ericsson an initial amount plus royalties over seven years. So yeah, it just seems like, okay, well, we have the money. Let's just settle this and, and hopefully collaborate in the future. Yeah, and I wonder what that collaboration means, if it means that Ericsson is going to be supplying uh, more technology to operate Apple products. Um, Ericsson is in, you know, not not in pole position. It doesn't probably have the huge buffer of money. So what can Ericsson get out of this other than the settlement agreement? And ongoing business is actually probably even better than that settlement sum. 
So in other news, more people are replacing a home brand broadband connection with a smartphone, uh, but there could be serious ramifications of this for the poor, for people living in rural places, and African Americans. This is according to Pew Research Center. I guess broadband, according to the Home Broadband 2015 study, broadband has plateaued. It's the same as it was in 2012. It could be a blip, they say, but it could be a disturbing trend where people uh, who can't afford broadband are just settling with smartphones uh, instead of having a broadband connection. But there are a lot of things uh, that that you need a broadband connection to do that that really have direct effects on your upward mobility, your ability to get a job, or you know, and and also just just general. I mean, at this point living. So, and what do you think about the this Pew research study? Sure. Well, I think it definitely, I mean, it seems to me that statistically the plateau is there because I think that broadband adoption actually went down, which could be a blip, um, but it doesn't seem like it, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it would be a blip um, up, right? It doesn't seem like that would be an error in the opposite direction. So at the very least, it's probably flat. And that's very interesting. I think what is going to be a challenge is making sure that companies, if adoption is stabilizing, continue to make all of their products really easy to use on mobile, which, you know, ironically works in sort of a retail situation, right? Companies who, who are very motivated for people to be able to use their product on mobile make it easy, but say government organizations and people who are providing the infrastructure that lots of people, especially low income people need, often don't have easy to use mobile sites. And that's where we really get into trouble. Right. I mean, because one of the things they were using as, as an example is, you know, it's very difficult to write out a cover letter uh, for a job. Um, but I don't even know if that's what you still need to do these days. And I've certainly heard of lots of apps, uh, new apps that that are that do make it easier for people to find jobs. I know that's the, not the only thing, uh, but I, I don't know if that if writing a cover letter is is what's keeping people from getting a job at this point. I don't think so, especially not if you're talking about entry level jobs or sort of basic jobs. But I do think that when you're applying for assistance or you're just generally trying to surf the internet quickly to get a lot done, it's sort of that productivity part. It's hard to multitask on a phone sometimes and sometimes very distracting. And I think that's part of the challenge, right? Like not being able to see the big picture. It also just kind of stinks. I mean, now it you may be able to save some money on say media, if you cord cut, uh, it's a lot harder to cord cut, like impossible if you don't have a broadband connection. So that that kind of just quality of life issue is also key here, I think. Right, and the services, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good point. I mean, there's so many services for low income, income people uh, for meals and, you know, help with meals and, uh, and help with finding jobs and, you know, shelter. And yeah, it's very difficult to find those on the tiny device. And like you were saying, those websites of nonprofits are, don't have a ton of money to create apps that, you know, work quickly on, on, a, on a device. So, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, Pew is some interesting things that Pew said. They said roughly two thirds, that 69% of Americans indicate that not having a home high speed internet connection would be a major disadvantage to finding a job, getting health information or accessing other key information. That's up from 56%. And um, that's interesting because that is from people with a home bro broadband. They say it would be difficult. Uh, they have this, this, they understand how it'd be difficult. And the people without, they say that 40% of non high speed users say that without, being, without broadband is a major disadvantage for learning about accessing government services compared with 25% who said this in 2010. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I think about th this doesn't get mentioned here, but homework and, and kids who come home and sometimes doing things like borrowing Chromebooks from school. But what use is that if you don't have broadband internet? There's absolutely no way you can turn in your paper. I mean, you can type it out on a smartphone. That is not the way you want to be able to write a research paper. So really low income kids have to go to the library and cannot do their work from home, which is, I think, a huge disadvantage. Absolutely. And if you talk about tethering, you know, that's what someone might say, well, you could tether your smartphone to a Chromebook, but then you run up against data caps and then that's the cost. And that's the same issue when we were talking about, you know, just pay for phone service. I mean, that that is difficult without with broadband, sure. you're, you're not running up against those data caps. So. And it is expensive. I mean, tethering and paying for the plan that allow you to do all of your work over your smartphone is not a cheap proposition. So it doesn't really help. 
Well, this episode is brought to you by Epson. Epson's revolutionary EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The new EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer does not use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an innovative refillable ink tank. It comes with enough ink to print up to 8,500 pages. That's equivalent to about 50 ink cartridge sets. You're loaded and ready to print for up to two years. Powered by Epson's leading edge precision core technology, it delivers high speed, vivid colors and laser quality black text, plus auto two-sided printing, a 30 page auto document feeder and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with ultra low cost replacement ink bottles. Now you have the freedom to print without running out of ink. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home office or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the new Epson ecotank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson for their support. The research on concussions and brain damage suffered by football players has prompted countless news stories and even a new film about the attempts of one forensic pathologist to expose the truth about brain injuries in the NFL. What is being done to help protect players? Christina Farr, senior writer at Fast Company, recently wrote about the tech that could help protect uh, helmets. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so the NFL recently offered $500,000 to researchers to come up with new material, new technology that could be incorporated into sports equipment to reduce the impact of collisions. Uh, tell us about this contest. Sure. Um, so the NFL has set aside millions of dollars towards new technology to prevent, potentially prevent these kinds of head injuries that they've become so known for. Um, and one of the more recent news that came out last week is that they're now looking into material science. Um, so they want to fund research teams, and they actually just picked six that are going to be in the in the final, um, including a team from the University of Michigan. And these teams are coming up with new materials and textiles um, that can be used in sports equipment, um, including things like helmets and um, knee pads and shoulder pads that might be able to prevent or reduce the impact of an injury. And the NFL isn't saying we think that, you know, this can be used to prevent concussions altogether. And that might, in fact, be an impossible feat. Um, but just to be able to sort of reduce that impact, which, you know, imagine 300 pounds of human flesh charging at you at, at full tilt, um, it's it's going to cause damage. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what's coming next. Can you talk about some of those finalists? Give us some details about the types of materials and the types of technology that they're using to create those materials. The specifics are so interesting. Yeah, so there's um, there's two teams in particular that interested me. Um, one of them I mentioned is the University of Michigan. Um, and they're, they're trying to develop a lightweight material that's like a textile. Um, it's multi-layered and composite. And the idea is that it's like specifically tailored to multiple and targeted blows. Um, so it's helpful for not just football, but other types of, of sports as well. And then another company called Corsair Innovations, which is a textiles company. And they're looking at foam-based spring-like um, tiny fibers that can repel the force of an, of an impact. Um, and the other interesting thing about this, this competition is that it's also in partnership with Under Armour. Um, so any of these textiles that come out of the lab that are deemed potentially um, ready to commercialize, um, you could see Under Armour, Under Armour um, incorporating them into the sort of next generation of, of uh, sports equipment and clothing. So uh, you are you say that they're not trying to prevent concussions, that that's probably not possible. Um, so, so they're just trying to, to reduce it. Um, what there's, there's five finalists here, and uh, when when will the winner be released? The, sometime in 2016, um, and that winner is going to receive $500,000. And I actually talked to the NFL um, last week about this whole program, and um, you know they, they say that they do hope that um, this will be beneficial um, way beyond fo football, um, professional football, but also you know if you think about... Um, reducing um, the impact of, say, a motorcycle accident um, or potentially firefighters, people who might um, experience some kind of high impact in the in the sort of course of their day jobs. Also, even um, college level, high school level sports as well. Um, so they're hoping that this might have a trickle down effect. So these these manufacturers are going to create a technology that hopefully helps their business as well and, and really can help other people. Are there 
Are, are there specific, are we using lots, is this all 3D printed material? Is there is there anything about the technology that's different from what's currently out there? I'm just so curious about how these labs are coming up with these ideas. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's cool about it is is that the NFL said that a lot of these material science labs are based out of in universities, and um, the teams themselves, like a lot of them, have zero interest in football. Um, and this is kind of a competition that attempts to sort of draw them in um, to create these new textiles for those kinds of purposes. So it's it's sort of the first time that um, you know professional sports has really thought about ways to sort of collaborate. Um, with these teams who are creating sort of, you know, the next generation of, of materials. So you point out in your article, this is a lot of money that they're giving towards um, these next generation technologies. Uh, but what about the players who've already suffered injuries? Um, is there any, are there any contests involved technology that might, might help people that, 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 you know, f former football players that have already suffered from concussions and, and all the ramifications of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to uh, Keith Mitchell, who is a, a retired player and has, you know, experienced um, a lot of pain, um, especially in the last sort of decade after, after leaving professional sports. Um, he had a spinal injury and um, he's he's managed to sort of alleviate some of that pain through like a very rigorous program of, of yoga and, and treatment. Um, and this particular competition is more focused on sort of diagnostics, pre prevention, reducing the impact of injuries for sports players who are on the field today. Um, and the NFL, you know, has also has other programs and is interested in other ways in in treating and caring for those um, who are already experiencing this, this, these injuries. Um, maybe people who played like Keith Mitchell in, in this, he was sort of more famous in the 90s. Um, but, you know, there are those, um, including Mitchell, who think that the NFL is not doing enough um, to help them um, and would like to see, you know, a lot of this kind of these sort of sexy competitions and, and press be focused on treatment and, ca and care, um, which is another sort of important part of, of the paradigm. Well, Christina Farr is a senior writer at Fast Company. Uh, do you have anything else that you're working on that you can talk to us about? Yeah, I, I took a break from my usual beat um, healthcare today to write about career transitions um, because I, I joined Fast Company last week um, and it got me thinking about, you know, what is the, what is the best way to sort of leave a job um, without, you know, uh, upsetting anyone or alienating anyone and then, and then to announce that you're joining a new one. Um, so I just, I put out my sort of first story on that topic this morning and I got some great advice and learned that I'd actually done it all wrong myself. <laughs> Um, so, you know, recommend giving it a read if, if you're thinking about leaving your job and, and heading on to something new. So what's one tip you could give someone who might be thinking about it? Uh, there's a bunch, but probably the best one was to announce that you're uh, leaving on, on social media on your last day. And I actually waited until my first day at Fast Company, which was a serious mistake um, because I delayed orientation and, and getting my benefits for like two, three days um, because I was so focused on kind of responding to people and saying thank you and updating all my social media. Um, but I should have done that two weeks ago. Um, so I think that's that's one of them. Another good one is maybe have a have a sort of event on your calendar six weeks out from the beginning of your new job. And anyone who responds and says, hey, like, congrats, let's get together. Um, you could, you know, maybe suggest doing a big group drink um, six weeks from now. So that way you can kind of focus on on your new job while also feeling like you're you're staying connected with with the contacts that you want to see. Well, Christina Farr, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on your new job. Christina is the senior writer at Fast Company and she's at Chrissy Farr on Twitter. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Nielsen released the list of the most popular apps of 2015. Joining us to talk about what this means is Mike Murphy from Quartz. Welcome, Mike. Hey, Megan. How are you? I'm good. So here's what I find most interesting about this list. All of the apps on the top 10 list are from one of three companies, Google, Facebook, and Apple, uh, mostly Google, even on iPhones. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of shows just how dominant they are. Um, you know, Facebook took the, took the top spot, but... I mean, half of the apps are, are, are from Google. And it, it just shows, you know, whether it's on desktop or on mobile, we really do kind of um, rely on Google for so many aspects of our lives. So is this the end of the independent app developer? I mean, it just sort of seems like, you know, five years ago, this list would have included apps from independent 
folks who have since either been acquired by one of those big developers or themselves have become a big developer. Uh, do you, just like, what do you think about that? Do you think that this is a death now? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think it's pretty much, um, you know, these are so monolithic and, and, you know, so many people need these sorts of services, whether that's like, you know, we're only going to have so many social networks that we update um, on a daily basis and we're only going to have so many email clients. But, you know, we might have a, a plethora of productivity tools or tons of different games on our, on our phone. You know, n there are no games in the, in the top app uh, list. So I think... Um, I think there's always going to be room for, for the independence. And I think that, you know, it, it even shows here with Instagram who was acquired by Facebook that there's, you know, there's always a hope to keep going because, you know, you may, you may, uh, you may too be acquired for billions of dollars. Yeah. So there's the acquisition of Instagram, which Instagram has mainly stayed exactly the same, pretty separate. And then there's the acquisition of, of something like Mailbox that was acquired by Dropbox and then um, ignored. And the technology was used in uh, for better ways in, in different apps. Uh, so there's and then then shut down, as we've heard. So there's also that that route some unfortunately go to. That's true. Yeah. I mean, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, there's a time delay here. I'm all the way over in London, so the, the internet's taking longer to get here. I think. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think it. Um, you know, there's there's going to be for every success, there's probably going to be a failure of that kind of um, that kind of size. But um, you know, so some of these services will will probably be in this list forever. I mean, Facebook and Google have have been around as long as the mobile platforms, and you know, it doesn't look like they're they're going to be going anywhere. But um, you know, I, I don't think Apple Music is going to be in there in another five years. So, so who's going to take its place? We have a, a, a question about Apple. I mean, Apple Music, are these all paying customers? 54.5 million people use it. It's the only new app. You don't think it's going to stick around? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'd be surprised um, unless, unless um, this turns out to be more than just like inertia, um, you know, for all the people that upgraded to iOS 9 or got a new iPhone in the last uh, year or so, and we're curious to see what it, um, what the app was, um, there could be a lot of people who are, you know, using the offline function of it, maybe not uh, paying for streaming. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just given the, 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 the kind of difficulties there seems to have been with the rollout of Apple Music, I, I, I'd be really surprised if it's quite as um, high up in, in another five years, but who knows? Well, the list said it had 26% year-over-year -year growth, but, I mean, the Apple Music we know wasn't around last year. So I think uh, what that probably means is just the music app, right? The people that, basically iTunes, people using, playing their own music on their phone. Uh, is that what that means, the 26% growth? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, that obviously was, um, you know, kind of subsuming the, the iTunes. There are a couple like that. I had to ask Nielsen, like Google Play. I was like, well, is that the store or is that any of the apps that are called Google Play? Because there's a fair few of them on Android and, and iOS. But uh, in that case, it was was actually the Google Play store, which shows that a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to figure out what other apps they want to download. So uh, what did the survey find uh, versus, like Android versus iOS? What, um, what, who has the market share right now? So um, it didn't break it down on an app-by-app app, uh, basis, but it did say in the U.S. that Android um, has about 53% of the market um, versus um, iOS, which has about 43%. So it's a really binary market. Um, you know, Microsoft, I think, had less than 3%. And I still love the fact that they felt the need to call out BlackBerry with, uh, I think it was 0.7% yeah, <laughs> of the market. It just seems more insulting than anything not to include it in the other section. Well, Mike Murphy, thank you for breaking down uh, this, the Nielsen report for us. And uh, Mike Murphy is a technology reporter at Quartz and at MCWM. Uh, and we probably won't talk to you until next year, but hope to uh, catch up with you next year on all the great technology reporting that you do. Thanks so much for coming on, Mike. Thanks. Happy holidays. And Lindsay, I know you have to go to a meeting. We're not quite done with the show, but uh, but I know you have somewhere to go, and we're looking forward to talking to you from CES on January 5th. Uh, do you have one quick CES prediction that you have time to give us? Oh, sure. I think we're going to see wearable weirdness, right? <laughs> like, this is going to be beyond smartwatches. We're going to see uh, technology all over your body. <laughs>
Uh, That's my prediction. All right. Well, uh, we will talk to you in the new year, Lindsay Turrentine. It's been great to talk to you. Have a great holiday. Lindsay is an edit- the editor-in-chief at CNET.com. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Take care. So if you used Google in the EU over the weekend, you might have seen a pop-up reminding you about data collection. Nothing has changed. Google Google just took this opportunity to remind you of its privacy policies in light of the data protection reform that the EU agreed to last week. And this episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. If you're a freelancer or you run a small business, chances are your least favorite part is rummaging through your receipts or creating, formatting, sending invoices, all those things. And the worst, tracking down companies who don't pay you on time. FreshBooks is a super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of businesses just like yours the tools to save time, billing, and get paid faster. Getting started on FreshBooks could not be easier even if you're not a numbers person. You'll be creating and sending invoices in minutes. You get paid up front. Now you can request a deposit in FreshBooks. No more covering costs out of pocket or waiting until the end of the project to get paid. FreshBooks lets you organize your expenses easily. Track your time almost instantly, even on mobile devices. With their automated late payment reminders, you can avoid those awkward emails to late paying clients. With FreshBooks automated customer reviews reports, you can see all of your reviews in one place, then easily post them on your website. FreshBooks just announced their new card reader. Now you can easily accept credit cards wherever businesses take you. Quickly and securely, right from your iPhone in less than a minute, FreshBooks card reader is EMV, that's chip card enabled, the new standard in the US. It works right out of the box. Just open your invoice from the FreshBooks app, plug in the reader and dip the chip or swipe the stripe. You'll wonder why you didn't start with FreshBooks sooner. If you have questions, help is free forever and you can always count on FreshBooks award-winning support rock stars to go above and beyond whenever you need a hand. Getting started is simple. It's it's totally free for 30 days. Go to freshbooks.com slash TNT. And don't forget to enter Tech News Today in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Start your 30-day free trial today, and we thank FreshBooks for supporting this episode of Tech News Today. And bad news, Hello Kitty Town is no longer safe from hackers. Is nothing sacred? The Guardian reports that there's been a data breach at SanrioTown.com, the online community for Hello Kitty fans. Passwords, forgotten password questions and answers... Names, birthdays, and more have been exposed and posted online. The passwords were hashed, but Sanrio used a technique that would easily allow a hacker to use brute force to crack them. And HelloKitty.com was also affected. affected. And even if you're not a Hello Kitty fan and you have no interest in going to HelloKitty.com, this is a good reminder not to use the same passwords on hobby websites that you do on sites where you enter credit card numbers and other personal information. And speaking of security, thanks to at Swift on security, the Taylor Swift Twitter parody account dedicated to the lighter side of privacy and security issues. Thank you for pointing us toward a Kickstarter that's dedicated to creating a fashionable tinfoil hat to protect you from all your possibly irrational concerns. Signal proof headwear might be a joke and it might just save your life. You never know. The Kickstarter campaign is raising funds to create a specially designed hat for bouncing electromagnetic waves and radiation. The company says the beanie will reliably reflect signals from cell phones, Wi-Fi routers, microwaves, and it generally blocks all waves waves transmitted from electric devices. They are calling it the most comfortable and functional headwear you have ever worn. What do you think? Would you wear this just in case? Do we need to protect ourselves from our devices? If you're going to wear a hat anyway, why not? Let me know what you think. Email me at Megan at twit.tv or find me on Twitter. I'm at Megan Maroney. And here's some feedback from someone who already found me. Aaron from North Dakota sent us this email. Good afternoon. I think your conversation with Christina Warren on Friday's TNT about the myriad choices for mobile wallets was spot on but with one important distinction to keep in mind. Payment standards. NFC-based payments, unlike most retailer-specific solutions, are standardized and work at any NFC terminal, as long as the retailer hasn't disabled the functionality. Google and Apple have smartly adopted this NFC standard that works universally. While it was mentioned on the show that retailers should pick Android Pay or pick Apple Pay, the solution is much simpler. Retailers should accept NFC payments and let users decide which compliant solution they prefer. Thank you so much, Aaron. You too can send email to tnt at twit.tv or megan at twit.tv. And our TNT fan of the day is Testy, who posted this picture on Twitter, watching the episode of TNT where I showed his picture of himself watching the episode of TNT where we were talking about monopolies and Testy was playing Monopoly. 
As Testy said, we've officially entered the twilight zone. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Facebook, Vine. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and I promise we'll find it. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, TuneIn, RSS. It doesn't matter where. Just subscribe, especially if you were only a Tech News Tonight fan. Make sure you subscribe to Tech News Today. We will be here for you. Choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also watch us live this week at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Starting January 4th, 2016, we are moving to 4 p.m. Pacific, midnight UTC. And uh, you can watch us there. Like I said, subscribe to Tech News Today. And uh, in the holiday week, Mike Elgin and I recorded several holiday interviews that uh, cover all the controversial topics of the year. So make sure to watch those. And if you're subscribed to Tech News Today, you will be able to watch them. And if you're ever in San Francisco, come on in. If you're in the Bay Area, we're up in Petaluma, not far. Watch us as part of our studio audience to do that. Send an email to tickets at twit.tv. And follow us on Twitter, Tech News Today TV. That is it for the Tech News Today. This show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Megan Maroney. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you tomorrow.